Hey guys, it's my friend Victoria, Season 1, Episode 3, Brocket Hall, and I was definitely looking forward to this episode overall. I really did enjoy uh, the two-part premiere. Even though I love the first part more than the second part, I still was really interested in seeing what this episode was going to give us, especially because, as I said, you know, they made a really bold attempt. Uh, well, not just bold, but it, it was very brave for them to not introduce Prince Albert into the first episode and actually do something completely different and have Victoria and Lord Melbourne be a couple. I actually like that the show is doing it, and this was another really great episode. I really did enjoy this overall. It was definitely closer to episode one than episode two. I enjoyed episode two, but I thought this definitely was a much stronger episode. Uh, but let's get into this episode. This is definitely more of a transition type episode, you know, setting some things up. There were some great scenes here, but definitely this is more of an episode that is setting a lot of things up for uh, what this season is going to be generally so let's just get into it so we start off and we see victoria she's talking to lord melbourne and these two are getting closer and closer by the day i mean you can just tell that these two uh that she's growing a very fond attachment to him you know she's openly flirting with one another during a palace meeting and uh he's even you can see lord melbourne himself is actually seeping with jealousy you know whenever she receives attention from someone else you know he really wants to be with her you can tell that she is genuinely getting feelings for him as well so he heads for brocket hall to gather his thoughts and unfamiliar surroundings so victoria takes matters into her own hands commanding lady emma's portman a marked carriage for an, inco an incognito visit to her would-be beau and amidst an impassioned conversation she confesses that she does not seem as a father figure but someone who actually has her heart which i thought this was a pretty good scene because you know up till now you know it seems like he was kind of just there to be sort of like her father figure and that's not who she sees him as she sees him as someone who generally she cares about and someone who we know she can really relate to because he's been in pretty much as much tragedy as she has remember as I've said, he would have killed himself if it had not been for Victoria. So really, I mean, they really do rely on each other in every way possible. And he reluctantly turns on her advances, which clearly has a devastating impact on both of them. But you can understand why. I mean, it's just really complicated for the way things are between these two. I, uh, you know, he can't really be with her because he knows that he's not the one for her. I think as much as he wants to be with Victoria, he knows in his heart he's not the one for her. And it's sad to see, but, you know, again, he's just not the one for her. So Victoria's preparing for the costume ball in honor of her uncle, and it appears that all is not lost with the unrequited love between her and Lord Melbourne because Lady Emma knowingly shares with her that the orchid he has sent holds great significance as he grew them himself. And she dismisses their importance, but Lady Emma insists the amount of care and time it takes to tend to such flowers, plus the fact that he closed his greenhouses after his wife died and it is massively telling that he sent her such a flower. You know, it's a pretty big deal that he did that, especially because, you know, he hasn't gone in there since his wife died, and we know how much of an impact that's had on him. So you can tell he definitely does have feelings for her, and this definitely is still open, you know. There definitely are feelings for each other, even though they can't really act on them. So Lady Dance, dressed as Queen Elizabeth and the Earl of Leicester, who is the Virgin Queen's companion, and Lord M tells a story of how the pair both understood that they were not free to marry, no matter what they both wanted, giving Victoria food for thought. And that is the main conflict Victoria deals with in this episode, is her whole idea with marriage, how... Even though she doesn't want to, she needs to find a husband because every queen needs a king. And that's something they feel that Victoria really needs to do. She needs to find a husband as soon as possible. And the big thing this episode has to do with King Leopold. King Leopold, uh, her uncle visits, and he arrives in London to visit his niece and his sister, the Duchess. And it soon clear his appearance is far from a regular vacation. You know, he's not just there to stop by, but he's there with an agenda of which the Duchess actually approves. Which is to have Victoria betrothed to the king's nephew, Prince Albert. And I like the way they built up uh, Prince Albert throughout this episode because we don't really get to see a ton of him. We've seen him in a couple scenes in this episode, but other than that, we just kind of describe him. And you can tell Victoria is not really interested in him. Lord Conroy demand, uh, determined to maintain his advisory position within the monarchy seeks to align himself in typical uh, simpering fashion to King Leopold's plans, only for the king to make it quite clear that Conroy is more transparent than a pane of glass. So... Really, it's not working in his benefit at all, and the forthright man doesn't think twice about voicing his opinions regarding anyone that might stand in the way of his plan to marry Victoria off to Albert, which includes Lord Melbourne. You know, I think he knows in his heart that this is not really what Victoria wants, but again, you know, she doesn't really have a choice. It's kind of just, uh, you know, uh, Albert or no one, so... 
Basically, we see in the meantime, not wishing to be outsmarted by the German side of the, du of the family, the Duke of Cumberland thinks his nephew, uh, Prince George of Cambridge, would actually be a much better match for Victoria. He feels that that's someone that Victoria would genuinely want to be with, leading to the rude and impatient dimwit being practically presented to her with a bow tied around him. So, I mean, this guy is not very smart, Prince George. I get why he thought that, because it's just kind of someone she could be with for whatever reason. You know, it wouldn't really be someone who would be of superior to her. I mean, this is clearly someone who's not very smart, so you can understand why he thought that, but in general, again, you can tell that she really wants Lord Melbourne, so with Cumberland's plan in tatters, Lord Melbourne seemingly out of the picture, and Comrade clearly no match for King Leopold, the Belgian ruler sends for Prince Albert so he can take his own campaign up a notch, and the handsome prince's brother Ernest arrives, the episode draws to a close, and we'll get to that at the end of the episode, uh, but I thought that was interesting uh, where this is going overall. I definitely did like seeing where we're headed uh, with Prince Albert in this episode. It's definitely quite interesting, but we do get to the end, and we he interrupts a piano recital actually being given by Victoria, and engrossed in the piece she's performing, he joins her the piano, turning the page for her at just the right moment, much to the surprise and shock of the queen, and there may even be a tiny spark of attraction as he actually holds her gaze. So, we don't really know. Maybe these two have a future. I mean, we know the obvious. We know the inevitable is that these two are going to end up together, but at the same time, they might actually start getting genuine feelings for each other, and I'm interested in seeing really where this plot is going to go. So Lord Conroy continues his viper-like slithering around place cor uh, corridors, trying to achieve his agenda while keeping the Duchess heavily reliant on him, and as his desperation glows, Conroy speaks about the Queen with his would-be allies and anyone who stands in his way, increasingly derogatory terms. He even cariously tells uh, Lazen that the only hope for her reign now is for her to marry a man um, who can control her, which, again, is, is just really disrespectful for him to say and that basically the only reason she'd marry is so she can be controlled so it's basically telling her that you're terrible at your job and again he's just again he's being the villain of the show and i think they're doing a good job with having us completely hate lord conroy in every way possible they're doing a pretty good job with that because i fucking hate this guy really i mean everything he says uh is just so foul and rude and you can really tell why they want us to dislike sir john as much as they do i mean this is just just someone who anything he does uh he's causing a lot of problems and more and more people appear to stay in his way. The slippery advisor is left clinging on his fingertips, especially after Leopold plants the seed of doubt in the Duchess's head about the level of her advisor's devotion. It's just, again, uh, things are really going his way, we can see. So, again, this is all orchestrated by uh, Sir John, and at the costume ball, Victoria dances with John in a bid to understand his motivations, but as usual, he can't help but throw veiled insults at her while insisting he knows what's best for her in order to prevent her foolish outbursts, and she, of course, increased by his rudeness and unimpressed at his candor given her position, she later spots an opportunity to leverage her role, finally remove him from her life, and dangling the care of an Irish along with a handsome uh, yearly pension on the proviso that he leaves, as suspected his devotion to the Duchess only goes so far, and the temptation that Victoria's offer proves too much for him to refuse. So it seems that Victoria actually has him wrapped around her finger, and I like that. I like that Sir John is not getting what he wants. I mean, I think he wants to, but you can definitely tell that this is not going great. Uh, you know, definitely this is not going the way that he wants it to go, and I don't want it to. I don't want anything to go uh, the way that uh, Sir John wants to go because, again, he's just a really vile, foul guy who's, you know, a control freak and will do anything to stay in power, and I like the way that he very slowly is getting demoted. I like the direction that's headed, but with Lord Melbourne being the one that Victoria wants but can't have, she finds herself fending off suitors from all corners. Even while suffering the first crushing sensation of heartbreak, she can't seem to have a moment to lick her wounds in peace, and as both her uncles push men towards her, the wonderfully handsy but charming Russian Grand Duke still in the mix, it's no wonder that Victoria has her fill and declares that she's having none of it and will, you know, will not be told who to marry. She will do, you know, she will marry who she wants to marry, and I, again, I like that independence in Victoria. That's something I've loved about her since the beginning, that carries throughout this episode, and I think they're doing that pretty well here. I definitely like that independent side to her that we've been seeing so far. So one by one, the suitors bow out, and Prince George, in less than gracious manner, having loudly insulted Victoria the costume ball, which she hears, while the Grand Dukes reluctantly called back home, having been betrothed to a Danish princess.
princess, and in a rare moment of tenderness between the young queen and her mother, they actually comfort each other, and this was a really nice moment. Up till now, her mother really hasn't shown her anything but uh, be very sufficient, and be very sophisticated, and basically just kind of be for her, be there for her when she needs to be. Not if she wants to be, but when she needs to be. And here, her mother actually seems like she genuinely wants to help her daughter, and during which Victoria expresses a fear that she will actually never be happy. She has this real worry that because of her being queen, she's never going to feel happiness, and the Duchess tries to reassure her that no man would give her up unless he was aware that it was his duty. Uh, that that's basically, you know, no one would just completely get rid of her unless they they had to, you know, they would cling to her because Victoria is so likable, and I really like that scene. I mean, a show that's so over the top and sometimes just not subtle at all, that was a really nice scene. I really did like that overall, and the following day she's very resolute that she will reign alone, but with companions the way that Queen Elizabeth did, as she asserts to Lord Melbourne while she paints a portrait of Queen Elizabeth, Lord Melbourne is adamant that she would not be happy to rule that way and that she deserves to find a husband who will love her the way that she deserves, and it should not be someone she chooses to please others, but in fact to please herself. You know, she should do whatever she can and for herself, not just for others. Because yes, as a queen, you do want to think of London and things like that, but sure, you know, pleasing yourself, that's what really matters. And despite the pair being unable to act on their feelings, it's clear the great affection and respect they have for each other is still very much evident in their interactions. And I like that. I like that they do have this care for each other. And even though they can't be together, they do still care. And again, I like where that's headed. So then we see uh, the common people here with the rise of the Charis Moon, the actions of the protesters start to have reaching consequence for the main protagonist of this episode. Not only does one of Victoria's royal engagements get disrupted by their protests, but Mrs. Jenkins receives news that her nephew is actually part of the Newport Uprising and will hang for what is regarded as an act of treason. So her devastation starts to impact on her work, leading to her confiding in Skeckert, and eventually Victoria knows that the Jenkins isn't herself, causing Skeckert, who, may I add, is actually played by Leary for Outlander, who I am so happy to see has a role where I don't find her bitchy. I really do like Skeckert so far, and she tactfully responds as she's struggling with the brutality being shown towards the protesters, and that many others feel the same. In discussing her concerns about the punishment with Lord Melbourne, he offers Victoria the opportunity to exercise her right to commute their sentences and deport them to Australia, which she feels is much more merciful. So this provides Mrs. Jenkins with much needed comfort about her nephew, and elsewhere in the palace, Miss Frank Telly is determined to unravel the mystery of Miss Skeckert's past, but she's unwilling to play her his game. So, although she does reveal that she wasn't a prostitute, instead working the laundry at the brothel, the palace chef is keen to share an allegiance with Skeckert, and as they both appear to have worked hard to get where they are, she dismisses the suggestion, clearly not trusting his motives, and Penji is then writing a book on who will succeed in becoming Victoria's husband, something that Skeckert wants no part of as they attempt to profit from their queen's forced matchmaking. So, they want to do what they can be to not let her marry, because they know this is really not what Victoria wants, but the problem is that Skecker can't really control that, and that brings the episode to a very inevitable but kind of sad close, and that is the way the episode ends overall, but let's just get this episode and talk about where I think we're going to go from here. So, really good episode. I definitely really did like uh, where this episode took us. I thought there was some really good stuff going on here. Let's talk about Victoria and Albert, because right now, I don't see the chemistry. I really don't, but I don't think we're supposed to. I don't think we're supposed to get the sense that these are two people who are made for each other, that these are two people who should be together. No, because we know that this is not what Victoria wants. We know that Albert is just not someone that she really wants to be with. And I've heard many people complain about Victoria and Melbourne and how it's very unrealistic. I think it's actually adding to the show. It's given us more of a view on Victoria's personal opinion and what she really wants. Because like I said, she's very independent. She likes to choose for herself. But I think at the end of the day, she kind of knows that she needs to marry Prince Albert and that she doesn't really have much of a choice there. She will do whatever she can to make sure that her voice be heard. But there's only so far she can go. There are going to be some things along the way that are just kind of out of her control. And this, unfortunately, is one of those things. And it's sad because, again, you can tell these two, they don't really have that chemistry that everyone wants them to have. But at the same time, you know, they don't completely hate each other. It just kind of seems like they don't really, um, 
you know, know where, you know, where, know exactly where to go, you know, do they want to be together or not, so I'm interested in seeing the way that relation is going to develop, and I do like the way that Melbourne is still in her life, even though these two, you know, he did turn her down and tell her that they can't be anything more than friends, I mean, it was definitely sad, but I thought he was a good guy in that regard, I think Melbourne knows that he's just not the one for her, as much as I think he wants to be, their timing is terrible, I mean, she's set to marry Prince Albert, not Melbourne, I think deep down, he does care about Victoria, he does want to marry her, but he just knows he's not the right guy for it. He doesn't have the royalty for it, he doesn't have the history for it, he's not prepared for that kind of thing. Hell, we know that he wants no part of the royal council, he just wants to be in Victoria's life. He doesn't want all the paperwork and things like that, he wants to be demoted, so it makes sense why Melbourne does not want to go with this position, it's just not really convenient for him, and I like that, I like the direction that's going. I also really like the character development we got here, with uh, with the Victoria's mother specifically. I like that we saw her actually be a good mother to Victoria. I thought that was definitely very well done. I like the direction they were going with that. I thought all of that all was definitely really good. And I thought the other stuff, like Miss Skeckert and the whole thing that was going on with her and Ms. Mrs. Jenkins especially, you know, what they, they really did a good job in the show. What I like is that it's not just about Victoria, you know, uprising. It's also about um, the war that was going on, because there was a war going on, and the show really is not afraid to touch upon it, that there was a war going on and that there were some severe consequences. And Mrs. Jenkins' son, again, those are just kind of inevitable circumstances that she can't really do anything about. And uh, it's, it's very sad to see, but that's just kind of the way it was, and she can't really change it, unfortunately, so that was definitely very sad to see, um, and I like that they don't really want a part of it, but again, they can't control it, Victoria is set to marry, and they can't really control whether or not, um, she ends up marrying or not, it's just not in their decision, my only complaint with this episode is Sir John, as much as I think that the actor who's playing him is doing a magnificent job, because he really is fantastic in the role, you can tell he is like at a 10 in terms of character, he's loving every uh, ounce of what he's doing, I mean, I think that uh, Paul Rise is absolutely killing it as this character, He's getting a little bit cartoony, I definitely will say that. I think he's a little bit too involved in what's going on. It's a little bit unbelievable, a lot of what he's doing, but the show in general is not a show that is trying to be accurate. You can tell it's not a show about accuracy, it's more about entertainment, and right now it's succeeding. I'm enjoying the show so far, I think they did a good job, and this was definitely better than the second episode. I really did enjoy this episode overall. I do think the show, like I said, is getting a bit too over the top of points, but I think it's finding that good balance of genuine character moments and over the top and you know it definitely does have that sappy soap opera quality to it but it's it's still compelling enough and interesting enough where it's keeping me in it's not losing me in any sense and i'm very happy about that but overall guys i really do love this episode of victoria i thought this was very well done overall and i am going to give victoria season one episode three brocket hall a four to five or a b plus so over guys, my review of this episode of Victoria. Let me know what you guys thought of this episode overall. Loved your thoughts on it. Do you like where the show's going? Uh, do you like where the whole Victoria and Albert storyline's going? Just loved your thoughts on all of that. And that's it for this video. Hope you guys enjoyed it. We'll see you guys in my next video, which will be for tonight's episode of Supergirl. And we'll see you guys for that. Okay, bye.